Hello and uh, excuse me. Hello and good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Keyshawn White. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm born and raised on the southwest side of Fresno. I'm 21 years old. Um, when I started my project, it was just for the simple, off a simple question of what's going on in my community, and that transferred from how can I fight and advocate for my community, and then that transferred from what lane is my lane in the fight for my community. And the lane I chose was environmental justice. And the reason why I chose environmental justice was I felt like it was appropriate because at that time I was going through respiratory issues and I didn't know, really know why. A lot of people in that area were suffering respiratory issues and not really not knowing why. But from that, I wanted to figure out what was affecting my body. And comes to find out it's the pollution that was getting polluted by um, I can't remember what the plant called, but it was not too far from my apartments at the time. And started educating myself about how these plants are, this pollution can affect your body in the long term. And it's sad to say, not a lot of people in my community know about this. So I felt like I had to take upon myself to um, advocate for that. And so what I did was I partnered with um, multiple uh, youth groups and figured out ways to build up my advocacy, my advocacy skills so I can fight the good fight. Now, um, I've been working my project for almost six years now. Um, I know it's for a young person, it's, it's a long time. <laughs> um, and through this, this, this journey, I met incredible people, awesome networks. Um, multi many of my mentors is like, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Um, so it's not only with environmental justice that I what my project kind of holds in, but it's a, the big factor is this community in itself. Um, so I like to kind of pan my project out into like kind of factors. So one of them is um, youth engagement. So I like to go into schools and engage the youth about environmental justice and the uh, health, uh, the health risks of living in bad air quality. Another aspect is uh, air quality monitoring. Um, so in the midst of my project, we felt like it would be appropriate to kind of represent the whole Fresno in terms of air quality monitoring. So me and my mentor set out on uh, purchasing these purple air monitors and setting them up uh, as much as we can around Fresno. Uh, we partnered with Fresno Unified School District to set these monitors up at their high schools, um, which was at the time 12, uh, I think around 12 or 13 monitors. Um, and then we created an app around these monitors. so. Uh, let's say you're at Sunnyside High School in the area, you could just pull up the app and you can see the AQI of Sunnyside and that, around that area. And that's not, so we felt like that was appropriate not only for the schools, the students, the faculty, uh, but the parents for, uh, most definitely for sure. Um, so monitoring, youth engagement, um, and community involvement. Um, so now, right now, my project, uh, we're actually looking forward to a partnership with NASA in terms of upgrading our monitoring system around Fresno, California. And with this uh, upgraded monitoring system, we're also gonna try to tie it in with the curriculum at Fresno Unified and Clovis Unified Schools. So not only me, but students um, in Fresno can start learning about this higher grade um, technology in terms of air quality monitoring, because why not? <laughs> um, and from that, I'm um, pretty sure I'm trying to push into policy change and create um, a Green New Deal around Fresno to pretty much to put the pressure on these um, high emissions um, that's going around Fresno, especially the Industrial Triangle that's close to Malaga Elementary School, where fighting a good fight to push back on rerouting the bus, uh, rerouting the truck system so it's not going straight through the southwest side of Fresno. But I know it's kind of a lot I just dropped on y'all. Um, I'm open for questions, though, if there's any. Could you tell us about the tree planting project oh, that you're also leading? I'm sorry. Um, my mind goes a million miles per second. Uh, so we just tied up um, our Tree Fresno uh, campaign, which was pretty much building the Fresno tree canopy. Um, so we located a lot of areas with that, or through Fresno that's lacking a lot of green spaces and a lot of trees. and when Let's say if you don't have a lot of trees in a certain area, it creates a heat island effect. And a heat island is pretty much the sun beating down on the, um, pretty much the concrete and the rose and creates a pretty much higher, hotter 
uh, temperature in your area. So, and crazy story about that. Um, I was, I would say I was like around 10 or 11. Well, I was telling my mentor, like, when we bust from the north side of Fresno, come to the southwest side, it's like extremely like hotter. But he, he thought it was just crazy. He's been saying it until they actually came out with a report of the heat island effect and was like, man, this youth was telling me that about this for years now. So, and that kind of opened his eyes to like never kind of second guess a, a youth perspective on their environment. Because they are the best ones that's gonna not overthink it like us adults do as many, uh, a lot. Um, so in the midst of, oh, go ahead. Um, to be specific, um, it's the southwest side of Fresno, and there's many factors that can tie to why the southwest side of Fresno is kind of got the bad air quality in Fresno, because we all know Fresno in a whole has bad air quality, but to be specific, where's the pinpoint the bad air quality is in Fresno is the southwest side. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. It is my great pleasure to introduce our two guest speakers who will offer the sermon this morning. Connie Young is a re re retired registered nurse and mother of two adult daughters. She became interested in environmental issues when she joined the Unitarian Universalist Church of Fresno about 15 years ago. She retired, retired a little early to work on climate change. She's a member of the church's environmental and social justice teams, as well as the Tehippity chapter of the Sierra Club and Citizens Climate Lobby. Our second speaker is Katerina Friesen, who is a pastor at Wild Church and an organizer for climate justice with the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition, a faith-based group that seeks to address ongoing colonization of indigenous lands. She loves gardening as a practice to connect with the earth and tend ourselves, and volunteers with the Insight Garden Program to grow healing gardens with incarcerated people in California state prisons. I look forward to hearing from both of our speakers. Good morning and happy Earth Day. I'd like to thank the Sunday Services team for the honor of speaking here today and Tim and Worship Arts team for their assistance as I prepared. Thanks too to many of you for inspiring me to get involved in environmental work. The sermons I've heard here and those of you working on environmental justice and stewardship issues have challenged me to get involved and then stick with it. I'm especially indebted to senior members of this congregation like Shirley Valle for their advice and words of encouragement over the years. That meant a lot to me. And now that my hair has turned gray, I'm trying to pay it forward. Perhaps the main reason I joined this church was because it was planning to build a LEED certified sanctuary. I was impressed that this Congress, congregation, excuse me, was willing to put its money where its mouth was and live out its UU values by resting lightly on the land. But back to Earth Day. Why talk about it now? With the twin existential threats of cli the climate crisis and the potential for World War III in the news almost every day, why talk about a single day filled with music, laughter, good food, and new ideas? 
because more than ever, we need to celebrate and savor our planetary home and enlist more people in protecting it. When it comes to my approach to environmental work, I like to think of it as pleasantly subversive. The same might be said about Earth Day. After all, who wouldn't like to go to an event where you can test drive an electric vehicle or learn about incentives for solar panels or sample a luscious vegan dessert? But while you're there, you might sign up for a River Parkway hike or talk to somebody from the Sierra Club about the CMEX plans to blast a hole by our river. And soon, you're hooked. It's not that I don't care about serious environmental issues. Any of you who have talked to me uh, for more than five minutes know that I'm passionate about climate change. But my other passion is Earth Day. So that's my focus today. You see, I am an Earth Day ophile. Don't bother looking it up in the dictionary, it's not there. Not even Google could find it, despite that there are 277 other words that end in ophile. Nevertheless, I am an Earth Day ophile. I just really like Earth Day. <laughs> I suspect it may be genetic. My late Aunt Ibby really liked Earth Day too, so maybe I'm channeling her. Like any good ophile, I really like sharing this interest of mine. I'm guessing that some of you don't know about the connections between this church and the local observance of Earth Day. So I'm going to begin with a brief history lesson. And what history lesson would be complete without a pop quiz? So those of you on the alluvial campus may just call out your answers, and those of you online may type them into the chat. So first question. What book helped to inspire an environmental movement that led to the creation of the EPA as well as the first Earth Day? Was it An Inconvenient Truth, The Lorax, or Silent Spring? Yeah. By Rachel Carson, it documented the adverse environmental effects caused by the indiscriminate use of pesticides. That was Silent Spring. Next, what environmental disaster inspired then-Senator Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin to organize what came to be known as Earth Day? Was it the Santa Barbara oil spill, Hurricane Katrina, or the Dust Bowl? Yep. The Santa Barbara oil spill was the largest oil spill in the U.S. waters at that time, and it remains the largest oil spill to have occurred in the waters off California. Next, what photo is known as, quote, uh, the most influential environmental photo photograph ever taken, close quote? Was it the 1969 moon landing, Earthrise, or the blue marble? Aha. The answer is Earthrise, which was taken by astronaut William Anders in 1968 during the Apollo 8 mission. The first crewed, that's C-R-E-W-E-D, crewed vo voyage to orbit the moon. So you're doing great. <laughs> in what year was the first Earth Day held? 1950, 1970, or 2000, also known as Y2K? <laughs> 1970. Earth Day was first held on April 22, 1970 to demonstrate the support for environmental protection. It now includes a wide range of coordinated global events involving over 1 billion people and more than 193 countries. Next question. What member of this congregation helped organize the first Earth Day teach-in at Fresno State, which was known as Fresno State College at the time in 1970. Was it Dick Haas, Betsy Temple, or Sam Zutler? <laughs> yep, 
yes, that would be the late Dick Haas, a Fresno State professor of biology. Here he is, 40 years later, speaking at Fresno, Fresno Earth Day here at the UU. Just an aside, can you see the masks on the demonstrators? I don't know if they show up there. According to the caption, a dozen art students illustrated the noise and cultural pollution that envelops us every day. They wore earphones and plastic face masks and ran simultaneously a buzz saw, a huge vacuum cleaner, a radio, record player, and tape recorder while gazing at a blank TV screen. <laughs> In the ensuing years after that first Earth Day, there were sporadic observances in and around Fresno. A cleanup here, a lecture there, a tree planting somewhere. No doubt UUs were involved in them as well. Then, in the early 2000s, a group of organizers held several annual Earth Day events downtown in Courthouse Park. After three or four years, they stopped holding them because reportedly, PETA objected to their plans to have llamas or some other live animal at the event. A few more years went by, and the leadership Fresno class of 2007 hosted an, an Earth Day event at Eaton Plaza. Our church had a booth there and displayed this model of the LEED certified building that was then under construction here on Alluvial Avenue. Last question. When did the UU Church of Fresno hold its first traditional community-wide Earth Day event? Was it 1970, 2008, our first year in the new sanctuary, or 2010? <laughs> in 2010, the Green Sanctuary and Social Justice Coordinating Committees and a class at Fresno Pacific University collaborated on what was to become the first of many annual Earth Day events held in Fresno. We held it here for two more years until the event outgrew the campus and moved to Courthouse Park. But, as you can see, UUs were still very involved. That's UU Betty Cornelson on the right. From there, the event moved to its most recent home at Radio Park. As you can see, this congregation has been integrally involved with Earth Day every step of the way. Since 2010, the, search pro the church provided meeting space, the venue for three years, and generous financial support. It also contributed human resources, including much of its leadership, stolen thunder, and other UU musicians, and many, many volunteers. Please wave if you've helped with an Earth Day event or tap, uh, type ED in uh, the chat if you've helped out. Yeah, lots. <laughs> Our involvement has led to mutual support and alliances with many local environmental organizations. This event, after all, is about making connections between people and organizations, humans and non-humans, and between us and our planet. It also helps people see that the things that are damaging to our environment and climate are also harming people, including us. Now, you may recall that I said that I was often challenged by UU sermons, so today I'd like to challenge you to do two things in honor of Earth Day. First is to talk about the climate crisis. Many climate leaders have said that this is one of the most important things we can do. Try having a conversation about it with someone who may have a different opinion, a coworker, a friend, a neighbor. I'm not suggesting, however, engaging with an outright climate denier, but rather someone who might be willing to have a reasonable conversation with you. You might begin with something you share in common. Family, friends, a hobby, a favorite hiking place or fishing spot. If possible, link your common interest to climate change and express your concern. For example, 
Let's say that you and a friend both like to ski. You might say, I had a heck of a time finding snow this winter. How about you? If your friend had a similar experience, then broach the subject of climate change. You don't need to change their minds. Just listen to their point of view and ask if you might share yours. The important thing is to keep people thinking and talking about this subject. You can also mention the climate crisis in a letter to the editor, a blog, or other social media posts. Asking questions about climate change at candidates' forums and town hall meetings are a great way to make candidates, elected officials, and the audience aware of public concern about this topic and get candidates' opinions and statements about it on the public record. My second challenge is to join or become more active in an environmental organization. Protecting the environment is not a spectator sport. Here are just a few of the better known organizations that advocate and educate about climate change, air and water pollution, and land use issues. And here are some of the groups that offer environmental stewardship opportunities. And of course, there are mo lots more organizations. Of course, one of my favorite organizations is Earth Day Fresno, which is incorporating to become a year-round organization. In addition to hosting an annual community Earth Day event, we envision it augmenting the collective voice and impact of our many environmental organizations and connecting the community to our local environmental movement. If you might be interested in serving on the board for Earth Day Fresno and or planning next year's Earth Day event, please contact me at my email address that's on the screen. Earth Day can and should be every day as we connect and work with others who share our UU vision for a healthier and more equitable world. As a member of this church's environmental justice and sustainability team, I became connected with the newly formed Fresno Interfaith Climate Alliance. And there, I've had the good fortune of becoming acquainted with our next speaker, Katerina Friesen. As you will learn, Katerina is in New York right now, so she's recorded this reflection and another Earth Day challenge for us today. So thank you, and here's Katerina. Hi, my name is Katerina Friesen. I'm a descendant of Mennonite settlers and immigrants, of refugees from Ukraine who settled in California's Central Valley on indigenous Yokuts lands. I'd like to share a simple message this Earth Day related to my work with indigenous peoples and why I'm currently in New York when you hear this for the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. I work with a faith-based coalition addressing the intersection of climate change and colonization. We're called the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition. Some of you might have heard of the Doctrine of Discovery, maybe not. We seek to address the ways that the European Christian so-called discovery of indigenous lands, the discovery of lands that of course were already inhabited, resulted in a really harmful international legal system that continues to strip indigenous peoples of their lands and livelihoods today. Under colonization, indigenous ecological knowledge and ways of living and reciprocal relationships of respect with their homelands, practices that developed over thousands of years, are being replaced with an industrial model of consumption of, of resources that really are limited and finite. In other words, we're taking too much as settler societies from the earth without giving back. Colonization has turned gifts from creator, land, water, trees, minerals, into resources and commodities to be bought and sold for profit. 
And that system is not working out very well for all of us, as we can see evidenced by the climate crisis around us. Yet indigenous peoples are still here and around the world, they are on the front lines of climate change and environmental justice, protecting sacred waters, protecting lands, resisting fossil fuel pipelines, challenging extractive industries like mining and logging. I came to the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues with a colleague to accompany a Maya delegation from the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. They're facing threats to their land and waters and their collective organization called Kakushdal is seeking an intervention at the UN Forum to appeal for a response to the issues their communities face. Here's a quote from one of the delegates who's representing the Maya community describing some of these challenges. He says, quote, our sacred territory has a spirit. Water is a sacred being. We see today with profound pain that the sacred water is being poisoned with agrochemicals overexploited by genetically modified monocultures and other mega development projects in agro industry, energy, real estate, and of neocolonialism, like the Maya train project, unquote. All these forces that he named, industrial agriculture, the use of heavy pesticides, fertilizers, and GMO monocultures for export are destroying Maya forested lands. Mega development projects sponsored by the state of Mexico, like the Maya train, which you can look up after you hear about this, are going through their region without the free, prior, and informed consent of indigenous peoples, as outlined in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I want to read a quote from another representative from the Maya community. They say, Water is a sacred source of life the lifeblood of Mother Earth. We have subterranean waters moving underground in our region. So when there's contamination in one area, it doesn't just affect that area. This is the water that we want to give to our children and to future generations. And so we see the importance of defending our rights so that future generations can have clean water. And this is the message that I wanna share this Earth Day along these lines. We are all interconnected like water. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about this. He said, we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. In my Christian faith tradition, we say, when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. One part affects the whole. Yet our global economic system is set up to pretend like parts of our body don't matter. We're sacrificing members of our global community, our neighbors, in order to kept, keep other parts fed, watered, and comfortable and secure, and oftentimes very wealthy. We need profound fundamental shifts in our relationship with Earth, including deeper dependence within the local bioregions and watersheds where we live so we can relearn the limits of the lands we call home today on who's on the indigenous lands where we live. And so we need each of you and the communities that you represent. I invite you to pause and consider how might a view of land and water as sacred impact your advocacy for climate justice? Land and water not just as objects to be used, but as subjects to be respected. How can we join our advocacy together for ecological healing and work with indigenous peoples locally and globally who've been in the struggle for a livable future for over 500 years? And another question uh, for you to consider as I close, can you easily separate water once it's united? Can you separate land? And can you separate us when we are of one spirit and one beloved community? My hope this Earth Day is that we will wake up and recognize our interconnections and our power as communities standing in one spirit, standing with all who defend the sacred. Thank you. <laughs>